In this video, I'm going to derive the Friedman equation, which is the equation that tells us how the expansion of space varies with time. So it gives us what A of t actually is. It's arguably the most important and fundamental equation in all of cosmology. Now, to work it out properly, we'd need general relativity, which is well beyond the scope of this course. What I'm going to do in this video is derive it using Newtonian physics. And it turns out that, as well as giving us the core principle, this actually gives us exactly the right answer, as well as allowing us to understand what's going on. So, we're looking at how things move. How are we going to do that? Well, let's use energy. We're going to use the conservation of energy. For any galaxy, the total energy is going to be conserved. So total energy, let's call it U, which is going to be equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So if one goes up, the other one goes down. Now what's the kinetic energy? The kinetic energy of a galaxy is just its half mv squared. The normal equation for kinetic energy, mass of the galaxy, velocity of the galaxy squared. Now the potential energy is a bit harder. Let's imagine that we've got some spherical distribution of mass and an object of mass m up here. What's its potential energy? Well, this is originally worked out in Newtonian physics. If you know the distance from the center of mass to the object, the potential energy is just the negative value, gravitational constant, mass of this big distribution here, mass of the small thing, over r. And this distance here, r, is the distance from the center of gravity of the mass to your object. But what happens if you're actually inside the object? So instead of being out here, let's say your mass is in there. Now this, it turns out, is a trick. We saw this before if you did the first course in talking about dark matter. What you can do is if you're actually inside some distribution of mass, some spherically symmetric distribution of mass, is draw an imaginary sphere at this radius. And all the mass that's outside the sphere, so all this mass over here, it turns out you can ignore. Its gravity cancels out. All the mass inside, you can assume it's all approximated as a single lump in the middle with the same mass as that entire region. Now this is a Newton, called Newton's superb theorem. It's uh, of course came from Isaac Newton, as did so many other things, and it's an enormous simplification. It's why when a spacecraft is orbiting the Earth, you can just approximate the Earth as being a point at the center of mass of the Earth. But it's also going to be very useful to us here because of an extremely sneaky trick. You wouldn't think you could use this for the entire universe because the universe is homogeneous. It's not some spherical distribution of mass. But watch this trick. Let's pick a point somewhere in the universe, doesn't matter where, and we'll call that our centre. And now let's look at a galaxy of mass m at some distance r from our completely arbitrary point. Now it doesn't matter which galaxy we pick and which position we choose to be the centre of the universe. We could pick anything we like and we'll get the same answer. Now what we're going to do is completely arbitrarily divide the universe in two. We're going to, to draw an imaginary sphere of radius r around our point, and we're going to deal with all the matter inside and all the matter outside, and look at its effect. So we've got this particle m, and if this is our coordinate origin, we know from the Hubble law that its velocity is uh, it's going to have some velocity v outwards, and that's going to be the rate of change of r. So the kinetic energy is half mv squared, so that's a half mass of the galaxy r dot squared. Now remember that r dot is the rate of change of r, so it's just the velocity as measured from here. So we're doing everything in this particular coordinate frame. Of course, as you remember, from the galaxy's point of view, it's stationary and this thing's moving apart. But because the universe is isotropic, we can pick any set of coordinates we like, and we should get an identical answer. So anyway, let's pick this as our origin, so we get kinetic energy equals half mr dot squared. How about potential energy? Well, 
all the universe outside the sphere, the universe is uniform and isotropic, it's the same everywhere, so that's spherically symmetric, an infinite universe is spherically symmetric, I suppose, as much as anything else, there's equal mass in every direction. So what this means is all the mass further out, all the mass out here, will have no net gravitational effect, it will cancel out. And all the mass inside, we can pretend it's a lump in the centre. So the potential energy is going to be minus g, the entire mass inside that imaginary purple circle, m over r. Now what's the mass inside that circle? That is just going to be the volume, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed times the density. So what that's giving us is that the total energy, u, is going to be half m r dot squared minus, substitute this into here, you're going to get 4 pi over 3 g density r squared m. Now, this may sound like a complete cheat to you. Why are we measuring it relative to this uniform isotropic? We could do it regard to anywhere else. Why this imaginary purple circle and sphere and not something else? Well, it turns out it doesn't matter. You can pick any circle you like, any sphere, any location, and you will get the same answer. You have a different R, depending where you are, but it turns out that doesn't actually matter. We'll get the same general answer, whatever we do, because the uniform universe is all the same everywhere. Okay. So that's given us our energy equation, and we know this energy, total energy U, is going to be conserved. So if the potential energy changes, the kinetic energy must change the cancel, and vice versa. Now our next step is to do a rather tricky change in coordinates. So far we've been measuring positions and coordinates in the normal way, what are called physical coordinates. That's like the grid we've got in this image here. But if we measure it in these coordinates, then galaxies are moving. However, there is an alternative. Instead of measuring coordinates in physical coordinates, we can measure in what are called co-moving coordinates. Co-moving coordinates are the coordinates that something would have right now, and the scale factor of the universe is 1. In this simulation, I've shown the co-moving coordinates as the green grid, as opposed to the grey grid, which are the physical, proper coordinates. And what you can see is that these green coordinates are expanding with the galaxies. So the galaxies remain in the same location uh, regardless of the expansion of space. We have to define some time when the scale factor of the universe is 1. It's typically defined as today, in which case the physical coordinates and the co-moving coordinates are the same. But at any other time, say in the future, the co-moving coordinate grid has expanded to keep following the galaxy, so any galaxy will remain in the same place regardless of time. So let's put these new coordinates into mathematical form. What we're going to say is that r, which is a vector, is going to be equal to the scale factor of the universe times its co-moving coordinates, x. So x doesn't change for an object, that's just fixed. It's R that's changing. The reason it's changing is we've got this A of T. So if we take that and substitute it into here, what we find is that we get the total energy is equal to half m R dot squared. Now, R dot squared, to differentiate this, is going to be the differential of that. X isn't changing, so it's just going to be A dot squared times x squared. Over here, we're just going to replace r with a of t, so it's going to be minus 4 pi over 3 g rho a squared x squared m. Now we're very close to having our final equation. We're just going to do a bit of rearranging. What we're going to do is multiply both sides by 2 over m a squared x squared and rearrange. I'll leave that as an exercise for you, but if you do that, multiply both sides of the equation by this, you end up with the classical Friedman equation, which tells you that a dot over a 
squared equals 8 pi g over 3 times the density minus k c squared over a squared. Now what's this k? Well k is where we've bundled up all the constants we don't care about, so we have k equals minus 2u over mc squared x squared. Why have we bundled all that up? Well, everything else here, a dot over a, g density, is independent of where you are, what location you've got. So this is all going to be the same for any particle in the universe. Likewise, c and a are going to be the same for any particle in the universe. So therefore, as everything else is going to be the same everywhere, and we've assumed the universe is isotropic and uniform, that means k must be the same everywhere. So somehow these x's and the u must cancel out and to give you a constant. And in fact, it turns out that this k is exactly the same as the k we found in the Robertson-Walker metric, so the one that gave us the curvature of space. It's come back over here. So that's our equation, the Friedman equation, derived using Newtonian physics. But as I said, you get exactly the same answer if you do it using general relativity.